and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Garth Newfeld, along with Eric Landrum, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 135, where Eric had the opportunity to interview Spencer Malott from Englewood High School in Englewood, Colorado. And this is a very special episode. I'm going to get you to this episode really quickly. Uh, first off, Happy New Year. It's 2022. This is the first episode of the new year. And uh, Psych Sessions finished strong last year. Uh, and uh, we want to thank you for all your support. As you know, we are now a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Actually, we have been for a while. But we, we are now taking... Uh, donations, and we invite you, if you like what you're hearing, to uh, invest in this so that we can get more psych sessions out to teachers of psychology for free. So, feel free to head to bit.ly forward slash psych sessions donate all lowercase. That's bit.ly backslash forward slash forward slash Psych Sessions Donate, all lowercase, if you want to support us there. Uh, any contribution is welcome, and monthly contributions do help us set a budget for ourselves. Uh, we've got a great week. If you didn't check out the rest of the programming uh, in Psych Sessions, we brought it for the first week of 2022. We are releasing something like six different episodes, including a new series called Hero or Disruptor with Jane Hallinan. And uh, Beyond Teaching has a new episode coming out. And uh, we introduced a couple days ago our new Wizard of Operations. And you should listen to that. We brought uh, Afa, and I'm going to get her last name wrong, so I'm not going to butcher it here. Um, but Afa is uh, a good friend of ours. Uh, Eric works with Afa at Boise State University, and she is uh, part of the family. And she's going to help us get things organized so that we can do an even better job of what it is that we do. So, lots of new programming coming out, lots of new hosts. We're excited about 2022. Now, back to this episode with Spencer Malott from Englewood High School. Spencer is not a psychology teacher. We've talked to some psychology high school teachers, and those have been great conversations. Um, Spencer is a band instructor, and his instrument is the trombone which I think is cool. I also think it's cool that uh, if you just close your eyes and listen, you don't have to close your eyes, actually. If you close your eyes, I think Spencer sounds exactly like Chris Pratt from Parks and Recreation, so uh, now turned movie star, but uh, you can make that judgment for yourself. Anyway, I digress. Uh, there's lots of good teaching conversations here. Uh, I really liked how Spencer had an opinion about... Um, Folks who do teach music band who uh, who let their uh, practice go, so who aren't actively practicing their instrument, playing their instrument, gigging those kinds of things. Um, I I thought that was a really interesting conversation. You'll have to think about how that applies to us in teaching psychology because many of us are um, not out there in the workforce. And so, we do lack that uh, experience that uh, Spencer is able to give to his students. Uh, they cover a lot. Uh, the, the best part about this interview, well, it was maybe not the best part, but is the fun part, uh, is the big reveal near the end. Do not jump forward to that. Listen to the whole thing because it is a great, great teaching conversation. It's really neat to look into somebody else's discipline and... Um, and I really resonated with Spencer when he was talking about what it would mean to go on the job market to teach at a college or university and what would need to be done for that. It's such a commitment. And uh, yeah, so that's an interesting conversation as well. Yeah, stick around for the final. You're going to like it. Eric does a masterful job of getting there. Uh, it all makes sense in the end. And uh, we don't often play these kinds of games with you, but it's a fun one uh, this time around. So Folks, I'm going to get you to this episode. I want to uh, wish you and yours a uh, healthy and safe 2022 from our family uh, in Seattle and the Psych Sessions family more broadly to wherever you are listening to this. Uh, take good care of yourselves. Be safe and uh, have a wonderful new year. Here they are, Spencer Malott with Eric Landrum.
Welcome to another episode of Psych Sessions. I am thrilled to be here today with a new combination of person that we've never had on the podcast before. And I'm going to introduce Spencer here in a moment. We've introduced, we've had high school educators on before, and we've had folks on the podcast who were not psychologists before. Now we're going to put those two Venn diagrams together. We're going to have someone on the podcast who is a high school educator, but not a high school psychology educator. Welcome, Spencer. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is Spencer Malott. He teaches at Englewood High School in, is it Englewood, Colorado? It's Englewood, Colorado, but no one knows where Englewood is, so it's just say Denver. So, Colorado. okay. well, do you want to tell people where Englewood, Colorado is? Sure. Englewood is like a tiny little city within a city in Denver, and it's a very tight-knit community. Um, only four elementary schools, one middle school, one high school. And there's like an alternative high school for, you know, kids who don't want to go to an actual or a more traditional school. But yeah, Englewood is just a city within a city. Well, thanks for being here with me today. And at the end of this podcast, we'll reveal exactly the reason why you, but we're not going to get there quite yet. I'm because running by for the, president. I'm just kidding. Well, I, I am. We are really proud to announce that we don't normally break news, oh, right. but but this is kind of this is exciting. I got to tell you. Yeah. Thanks for saving that. Is this your first announcement for president? This is my first. Yeah, this is my nightmare. Announcing uh, for president. Is it president of the school board? President oh. of the U.S. Well, What's teachers it? can't be president of the school board. You have to be a community member. And I live in Aurora, so too far. Away. You don't live in a community. I don't live in the community. Oh, I guess. And not the Inglewood community. I thought. But I still don't know if you can be a teacher and be on the school board for, yeah, I'm sure you could be for another school district. Let's be clear that not everybody can be a teacher. And I actually want to have a serious conversation a lot with should you about that. <laughs> well, that, that's, not my, that's not my place to go. So tell our listening audience what you teach, please. Sure. I am a high school band director or instrumental music teacher. But you're also a professional musician. That's true. I'm a professional trombone player. I play in Denver and surrounding areas in jazz bands and variety bands, rock bands, all sorts of things. And if I am remembering my background research right, which you can see the copious notes that I have in oh, front yeah, of me. a whole stack. From the background research that I did. Groove in motion. Groove is that correct? in motion, yeah. In, As, with the N with, apostrophe or apostrophe N? It's just a groove, the letter N motion it's like psych sessions colon yeah uh conversations about teaching in stuff and stuff we and do stuff. the same thing my band leader always has to clarify he's always like groove in motion and people are like, groove and motion no groove the letter n motion yeah it's not in groove in motion okay or, or as my stepmom likes to call it moving and grooving that's my, i i think we should change the name because it's honestly better moving and grooving so I don't know a lot about music education, but I the two routes that I'm familiar with are music educator in college and music performance. Right. So it seems like you straddle both worlds. Would that be fair to say? I did. And I still, I, I never thought, well, I'll just, maybe I'll tie it back to my education in music. And I got a lot of my inspiration for why I wanted to be a band teacher, music teacher from my band director in high school. And he was, and I, he was a celebrated band director, but he was also an amazing musician and a professional musician as well. And I really liked that about him. I never really took music teachers seriously that didn't play their instrument. And I never wanted to be the band teacher that was, you know, preaching practice and preaching commitment to your craft. And then you ask them to pick their instrument and they're like, oh, that thing's too old. I can't pick that up. It's got dust on it. I don't have the chops for it anymore. I don't have time. I'm too busy being a band director. So important. Um, yeah, I just feel like it's so uh, important for kids to see their teacher be proficient, at least at their instrument, to take you seriously. Because if, if you're trying to get kids to be inspired by music or to get interested in music, shouldn't you show them that it can be played this way as opposed to just 
playing recordings for them. But how as a student did you have that savvy to feel that way? I mean, what age did you feel that way? I don't know. I think it was more just maybe tying more back into middle school even where I didn't have an idea of what instruments sounded like other than from recordings or performances and hearing my teacher's play at that high of a level. Well, that's what a saxophone's supposed to sound like. That's what a trumpet's supposed to sound like. That's what a trombone's supposed to sound like. Yeah, that that seems pretty savvy to me. If you're, what, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, and you're thinking, I want my band teacher or my orchestra teacher to to have musical sensibility that is so refined that they play the instrument well so that I can hear what a instrument played well sounds like well i think it's more in retrospect now because i don't know if i was that savvy at that age okay. because now i'm just seeing people in my field who don't play their instrument or or who have played it to a high level and then stopped for 20 years and i think i was just lucky because my middle school band director was a professional jazz saxophone player's name was jim stranahan are we allowed to name drop on here? absolutely absolutely if Jim Stranahan is listening to this podcast, how's it going, Jim? It's been a long time. We should get, catch up. He was a like relatively famous saxophone player in the Denver area, and his son now is actually a New York drummer, jazz drummer. And then my high school band director's name is Tim Libby. Also, Tim, if you're listening. <laughs> and he was a you know, well-practiced trumpet, jazz trumpet player in the Denver area. So I was just lucky to have these really incredible, ta- incredibly talented musicians be my band directors. But a lot of kids don't have that, and they just have the kind of grumpy old guy sitting up there preaching practice. You know, and I talk about luck a lot on this podcast, and and I don't know enough about the music profession and music education that if my typical rant applies here. So... It might truly be luck or fortune. I don't know. But was it luck or was it that you were a pretty good student and really decent teachers were put before you and you worked your butt off and you optimized your opportunity that was in front of you? And other students, by the way, who had the same really great teachers did not optimize their opportunity. Was it really just all luck or was there some combination of factors that made it great for you? Well, I will say that I was not a good student in band or in other subjects. I was kind of a brat, to be honest. And it actually helps me now as a teacher to see kids struggling or to see them with a bad attitude or a kind of facade they put on, like, well, I'm the cool guy or I'm the whatever, you know, and kind of can see through them. Hey, buddy, I've done that before. I know what that's about. So how about you tell me what's really going on or we can figure out how this is actually going to work for you because... Just thinking about me in high school, I actually conned my way into not being in marching band my first year of high school because I went straight to the source, guidance counselor, and I signed up for just jazz band, which was a no-no. Like, you were only allowed to sign up for jazz band if you were in marching band or in concert band, and I went to the counselor and she was like, what do you want to sign up for? What classes? Definitely jazz band. She's like, any other music classes? Nope, that's it. And my band director was furious with me. How did you get away with that? How did you... He's like, that's never happening again. Next semester, you're in all the bands. I was like, ah. And I'm so glad that I was. After the fact, my thought was that I wasn't going to play trombone in, in high school. I, I was All the cool people were uh, in football or in... Honestly, in theater. The theater program was like the crown jewel of my high school and all the cool kids are in theater and they, let's face it. they really were they had i saw them hanging out and they got to wear costumes and they got to do funny voices and then i've already done some voices so as you can tell i never really speak in my normal speaking voice on a day-to-day it's usually some kind of variation on german or russian or something but yeah i got out of i got out of concert band i got out of marching band but the next semester i was in the concert band and i was in the other groups. And I realized that, oh, wait, no, this is actually really cool. All of this, there's so much more to, to music than just, to just jazz. I was the person that only wanted to play jazz. I only wanted to improvise. I only wanted to kind of create and not go with these like, you know, formal classical traditions. And I realized that I was limiting myself by only being in this one vein. Yeah. So... 
The Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by Macmillan Learning Psychology. Introducing Macmillan Learning's Achieve for Psychology, setting a whole new standard for integrating assessments, activities, and analytics into your teaching. One way Achieve does this is through new goal setting and reflection surveys. Pre-built and easy to assign, these surveys help students define and attain their own personal goals for the class while giving instructors insights into each student's academic skills and emotional well-being. The goal setting and reflection surveys are just one tool in Achieve's suite of reports and insights and one example of how Achieve goes well beyond just delivering first-rate class-to-class course materials. For a preview of Achieve for Psychology, go to macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions. That's all lowercase, macmillanlearning.com forward slash psych sessions. And so, so, so now you see that in your current students who try to skirt the system. They try and only be in the one class that they like. You know, they think, okay, I just want to be in jazz band or I just want to be uh, in marching band. Honestly, you before, this is my first year at Inglewood High School. I was the middle school band director before. And the confusing part is that most middle schools and high schools are separated by, you know, a mile down the road or something like that. And my middle school and high school is actually combined. And we shared the same band room, shared the same hallway, shared the same office. I didn't even move desks when I got this job. I, uh, well, mostly out of laziness. I didn't want to move any of my stuff. And as a, as an educator yourself, you know, your desk is filled with all sorts of random things that couldn't be bothered to move to another desk. So yeah. So I was the middle school band director before, and now I'm the high school band director and I've lost my train of thought, obviously right now. Uh, no, that's okay. No, you have this detector for students who might be trying to skirt the system. Right. Trying to skirt the system. And the point of describing the whole school was that the marching band was actually the crown jewel of the high school that I teach at. And so people only want to do the marching band because it's we've got a big giant semi-truck trailer with a pirate ship on it. And we get to wear these cool uniforms and compete and go and get trophies and all these sort of exciting things and get accolades from the state and other schools. And so they think that marching band is the only thing that we provide, whereas... We have killer jazz bands, killer concert band, um, and there's so many other exciting opportunities for them that they're now just realizing. We played, we've played several gigs as jazz band, as my top jazz band. I've like taken them out to the community and played gigs, and I'm like, well, that's fun. What is that? What's that feeling? Playing for strangers? Whoa! And we got paid too. Well, they got paid from me. I bought them uh, donuts the next day, but you know, it was a paid gig. Don't want to, don't do anything for free if you're good at it, right? Good advice. But yeah, just giving them more opportunities outside of that one thing. And that's definitely what I got from high school band was realizing that you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into one thing, the one thing that you're good at. Okay. I'm only good at trombone. I'm just going to play trombone. Well, okay. Well, you can be good at trombone and all these different facets of music. And that's what I want to give my students is just the opportunity to be you know, more, explore more opportunities, I guess. So, Spence, where, can you pinpoint at all where your love of music came from? Probably from my mom, honestly. She's a professional musician. She is a um, retired choral director for 30 years. And she, yeah, anytime, I was always singing, and I would always sing with her, and we would do, you know, musicals and little performances on the holidays and all that sort of thing. So I always enjoyed playing with her and performing with her before I even picked up a trombone. Musicals on the holidays. So are there like home videos of these oh, there's, musicals? There's music. Yeah, I'm sure there there are some videos somewhere, but, um, you know, you know, they can be used as blackmail later. So I make sure that they're, uh, they're buried deep within the basements of the parentals of different home units. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. That's the beauty of, uh, separate households is you've got too much scattered throughout different basements that you don't know where things are. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because in doing my research for this interview, um, the internet is a treasure trove yeah. of, oh, uh, no. of information. <laughs> what did you find? And well, 
About 10 years ago, you posted a Vimeo. Yeah, and this always comes back to bite me. Does it? Oh, it's, every year. It's delightful about how to assemble a clarinet. Uh-huh. Again, now, for you listeners out there, please don't spell my name correctly because you'll find the video. It's one L, by the way. No. One L, two T's. <laughs> That's really the key to the last name. M-A-L-O-T-T. Okay. All right. I, you know, when they say, you know, be careful what you do in college because you'll regret it uh, later, you know, come back to get you or be careful what you put on the internet. I never thought it would be an educational video that would come back to haunt me. It's delightful. Because as a teacher, every year you get a new batch of students and every year they figure out how to find you in different ways. Now, I don't really use social media. I mean, I have a Facebook that I never really use, but or but I don't have that tactile social media. So what they do find is this video that you're talking about. It was the best five minutes, 58 <laughs> seconds of that day when I watched it, I got to tell you. And, uh, well, if you... If you watched it, then you know when I was talking about not using my normal voice. I don't know what came about me using a weird sort of gruntled smoker's voice, but it just came to me, you know, and that was the acting part of it's me that awesome. I really liked. I don't think I don't think any of my closest friends other than the ones who were in that video have seen that video. So. And then the inset where you have the flashback to Yeah, oh, the flashback. That's awesome. With with yeah, my good friend. So at the music school, there was these hallways with all the practice rooms. And that was just where you hung out as a music you know, major. Of course. You'd just be in the practice room all day long. Somehow, you know, Eureka, you'd figure out something different by just spending five hours in a practice room, right? Mostly just people on their phones or messing around with their instrument. No real practicing was happening. And if you're in music school right now, you're knowing exactly what I'm talking about. You're not doing anything. Right? If you're listening to this podcast in the practice room you're not practicing you're listening to a podcast. you're avoiding practicing <laughs> you're right? avoiding practice that's there where go. the practice that's the whole point of the practice room to avoid practice but i remember we were making this um this video and i'll explain the whole thing later but yeah I, I was just making it and then all of a sudden my friend was in the practice room next to me and he was a friend that i do voices with and i'm you know we're really silly and goofy together and i was like you have to be in this you know you have to i don't know how i'm going to make you a part of this but you have to be in this video. And, and he just riffed. He's like, okay, let's do it. Let's riff. Let's do whatever. And whatever voice came out of his mouth was just what we went with. Um, yeah. I will put a link in the show notes for this <laughs> to the Vimeo All right. about yeah, how to assemble that. a clarinet. It's very entertaining. Some of which was made in, at, you know, two, three in the morning. Different. We need to finish this project now. Absolutely. And it, it would be delightful to know at some point in time whether your fiance has seen this uh, video or not. Oh, yeah. I don't believe that she has. And, I, you know, as the wedding gets closer, I'll make sure that um, you, you reveal bits about and pieces the, I, and she can decide, you know, after she's seen the video, whether she's still interested. We'll circle back to, we'll <laughs> circle back to that, that, that topic later. So you mentioned music school. So a question that I frequently ask our guests on Psych Sessions growing up was, was the question or was the issue, I suppose, will you go to college or what college will you go to? I think it was, it was always you're going to college and but you can figure out what works for you. Speaking of which, I have to tie back to the fact that I was a poor student. I was, and not, not financially poor, but academically poor. I did not apply myself. I didn't. My stepmom always mentions, I never saw you studying. It's like, well, because I wasn't. I was, yeah, I was just a, a little bit of a wandering person. I didn't really like school. I didn't like to be there. I didn't like a classroom. I didn't like to sit still. Really, the only reason I went to school was so I could perform and be in band. And that was like where all my friends were and where the only thing I felt like I was good at was there, which in retrospect, it's not true. I was a good writer. I, I, you know, I, I have critical thinking skills. I can do all, I could have been a good student. I was just, I just think I was lazy. And with the going to college part, I didn't have the grades to get into a university that I would like. I had the performance ability. And I, in fact, I got into a music school. I got into the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, which is a fine school. It does smell like cow manure sometimes because of the cold front. So I wasn't looking forward to that. I got into the music school. I was accepted. And then I applied to the actual school. And they're like, no, you, your grades aren't good enough for that. So I had to come up with a backup plan. So before you go there, though, Spence, to be a good musician, 
don't you actually need those reading skills? And don't you need, isn't a good part of musicianship math? And don't you need, I mean, you kind of poo poo that you weren't good at some of those other things, but don't you kind of have to be good at those other things? I, Problem solving and. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just saying that I was, I think I was just lazy. I wasn't applying myself. I wasn't interested in it. So it was something that I didn't think I had to do. But if you were a good musician, I. I get the sense that maybe you were good at it and you weren't lazy. You just had a inaccurate self-perception. That's probably true. Yeah, this is psych session, so let's dive in. Well, and I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying if you were a good <laughs> musician, I mean, maybe you weren't enjoying the classes and maybe you weren't enjoying the teachers, but at some level, you had to be pretty good at the math and the problem solving and the troubleshooting and the managing your time and getting yourself to a gig and... You know, having, you know, you, you have to do all those things that you have to do as a 17-year-old, 18-year-old to, to to be a good musician. You just didn't enjoy the classes. That doesn't mean you weren't good at them. Yeah, I, th- I think my verbiage was incorrect in saying it. I'm, and I'm not trying to grade you. I'm just oh. trying to, I'm, I think you're being harder on yourself than you probably deserve. But you get to be the ultimate judge of that. All right, well, when I describe myself as a bad student, it's usually to inspire students who are feeling that same way in my classroom who are like, I'm failing everything. I'm doing this. It's like, well, let me tell you that I was a bad student. And by bad, I don't mean like I was disruptive or rude. I was very polite. I thought that being really nice to my teachers would get me a good grade. And that, that's not always the case. Actually, never the case, to be honest. But yeah, I thought if I could if I could get in and ask them how their day was and be you know really polite and really, I, I was very much like a, a, like a A plus student in the interpersonal connections with my teachers etiquette yeah. but yeah etiquette but it, you know etiquette doesn't get you a doesn't help you study for a test but yeah no i when i say bad i just i think i just mean like i didn't apply myself the way i probably okay. should have looking for more affordable quality materials for your intro psych students Check out Hawks Learning's mastery-based courseware and texts. These materials introduce foundational psychology and research concepts that inspire students of all majors to think more critically about the world around them. Take advantage of the software features designed with student learning in mind, like customizable lessons that allow you to add videos, Google Slides, forms, and more to illustrate concepts and deepen understanding. Explore these materials, available to students for as low as $43, alongside free chapter projects and example videos at www.hawkslearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Again, that's www.hawkslearning.com forward slash psych sessions. Yeah, I suspect it was there in you all the time. It was either circumstance or the teacher couldn't elicit it out of you or you weren't ready to do it. Because if it, I suspect, I don't know enough about being a musician, professional musician or, or educator, but I suspect if you're really bad at math, you probably can't be a good musician. There, that's a weird stereotype that I've been hearing my entire life. Oh, that, okay. So it's, yeah, it's that, wrong. No, I don't know if it's wrong. I think that for some, it, it, you can make, you can apply principles of mathematics to music myriad of ways. You can be like, okay, well, there's this many beats in a measure and this breaks down into, it, but really all it is fractions. So that's the extent of the mathematics that go into music and breaking down rhythms. But I'm not thinking about numbers when I'm looking at a rhythm. I'm not thinking, oh, there's four of those. There's three of those here. There's. I'm thinking about how the, the shape of that rhythm fits within the rest of the measure. So I think that the extent of the connection between math and music for me, and I'm not saying that this is how it is, just broken down into fractions and, and that's about it. I would bet that but that skill in you is so over-practiced that that's why you don't think about it anymore. Right. The, one of the best musicians I've ever met um, I asked him one time, I said, you know, what are you thinking about when you're improvising or doing a solo? He's like, I don't think at all. <laughs> I'm not thinking at all. And I try and think about, well, I try and do that myself and not think because I've already practiced all the things that will help me have a vocabulary, help me have a, uh, 
a cohesive idea with my improv with my improvisation that I'm not actually thinking about all the little aspects. Oh, here I'm like I gotta do a minor seven here. I gotta do a flat three five five. You know, whatever. I'm not thinking about that. I'm just trying to be musical. So where do you want to go? I, I don't know the trajectory. You know, if I was talking to a college professor, I would know the kind of assistant professor, associate professor, full professor. I would kind of know the typical route, the typical future, what the future holds for the college professor. What's the typical route for the high school band and orchestra teacher? What's the future desire? Yeah, so that's kind of the subject that's been on my mind a lot lately is what is my trajectory with my career? And I don't know, honestly. I think about how much it takes to do this job for 30 years and how much I've already done for it and with it. And I love my job. I love kids. I love teaching. I love being a mentor. I love, I love sharing my craft. I like getting kids excited about music, about performing together, about a community within a community, the band community. But I don't know what my trajectory is as far as long-term 30 years. I don't think that I would retire from being you know, employed from teaching at the, you know, public school level, probably. So yeah, I'm not really sure. And I don't think that higher education is for me because, you know, school's out. <laughs> I, no more books, no more papers. You know, I don't think I can write another educational dissertation on, on how to, um, on how to effectively conduct Holst's first suite. You know, I can't, I don't think I can do, and for non-musicians... The second suite is so much second better. Second suite, right, exactly. Yeah, sorry. But it's, <laughs> did you play that on no, French God, horn? No, God, no. I have no <laughs> idea what... If there is, even is a second suite, I'm there just is, yeah, BSing. There's a, there's a second. Yeah, I mean, it, you could, it's probably a third, fourth, fifth, whatever. It's not like Beethoven's, you know, 13th. It skips 13. It's unlucky. Right, unlucky. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, see, I'm losing my train of thought, Eric. What did I say? What was I saying? Oh, the higher ed isn't the right higher ed is not for me. I don't think I, I have always seen myself as here's my end game is being a college professor of trombone somewhere. Like that was always my thought in the back of my head. Like, but no, it's not your thought. Well, now it's just, it doesn't have to be that exact thing. Like, I don't think that I can go back to school and get a doctorate. I could very much do that. I have the capability. Good. I'm glad I can, to hear you say that. I can write those papers. I can go to school. But do I want to do those things? And I think the answer is no. Because at the end of the day, if I had my doctorate and I had a DMA in trombone performance or education or something like that. And I had this, you know, imagine me holding all these things, this big thing in my arms of, okay, I've got all the big things I need for this big job that I want, that my dream job. Then when I throw it out into the world, like, okay, where can I do it? I'd end up leaving home. I'd have to leave home. I'd have to leave where I feel comfortable. I get my, you know, fulfillment from, which is the place that I call home, which is Denver, which is Colorado. I've left home before and I, it wasn't for me, you know, and I'm sure there would be, there could be other places where I could make home, but I don't think I want to do that. I don't want to start over again in a new place. I've done it. I did it. I was able to start over and make new friends and, you know, make great professional connections and get to the same level of professional musician playing that I was in Denver before I left, but I was really happy to come back because I, I love where I live and I love being close to my family and being close to my friends and, and knowing a community. So so help me out here. A DMA is a doctor of musical arts. Okay. Yeah. And why does a, help me, why does a DMA mean you have to leave your current home? It, well, it doesn't necessarily but it means you have to go on a job market. You do for a have to go on a job than what you have now, right? And I, the possibility of getting a professor position, okay, in gotcha. the state of Colorado would be not impossible, but definitely very slim, just based off of the numbers. Gotcha. Because so to teach at a college, to or teach a university, at college or university, and to stay in Denver, there'd have to be a very specific. They'd have to build a new college, <laughs> or a professor of trombone would have to retire, right? At one of the schools in the Denver area. And there's two schools in the Denver area. There's the University of Denver, or as we call it, DU. But no one says Denver University. Thank you. I, I it's one of those weird that. things. It's 
We call it DU for some reason, even though on the masthead it says University of Denver. There is a professor of trombone at University of Denver. And then there is an associate professor of trombone. Like, I don't think you can get tenure at this college at Metro State University downtown, but they have different little studios. Like, they don't have a big studio. Like, you would have to teach tuba, trombone, and all the things, too. It's just one of those all-in-one sort of jobs. They're doing a lot of really cool things, though, at Metro State, and they've got a lot of growing programs. But I think they already have a trombone professor. They have a tuba They have a jazz trombone professor. They have everything there. But yeah, those would be the only ones. And then outside of the city limits, you've got University of Colorado, which my alma mater, which we also call CU for some reason. CU Boulder. CU Boulder. Yeah. We have the University of Colorado. And then further north, we've got CSU, Colorado State University. No change there. It's not the University of Colorado State. And and then if you go a little bit east of there, you've got UNC, which is the University of Northern Colorado. And so all of those have trom- trombone professors that are really happy being in those positions. And they actually, no offense to my trombone professor, but, you know, I would never leave that job if for a million years or a million dollars. It's the best job in the state. And he always used to say that to me. He's like, Spencer, I'm never leaving. This is the best job I've ever had. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, those are the opportunities to teach trombone at a collegiate level in the state of Colorado in Well, there's more, but that are not four or five hours away from the Denver area. But And you're pretty well connected. Do you you know all those people that in the positions? I don't know the professor at um, CSU, but I know all the professors at all the other universities. And would you ever have a desire to do the the total career professional route, like just become a gig, do gigs? I've thought about that, too. Um, Also kind of one of those things where the market in Denver is limited to what it is. We only have have to travel, right? We only have a few jazz clubs. We only have a few venues that actually have things going on all the time. And the work that I do in the band that I play in is mostly sporadic right now because of COVID. But when we're in the height of our season, which is usually summer, because we play a lot of weddings and outdoor events and things like that, it's a lot of travel. It's a hustle, you know, it's two hours here, two hours back. For, you know, for 200 bucks, you know, or something like that. And you spend all day on a Saturday. You you leave at 10 in the morning and come back at 1 in the morning the next day. And you're like, okay, well, hey, I got 200 bucks. So that's pretty sweet. That's for the love of playing. That's, it really is. That's not for, and, and keeping sharp. Yeah. And seeing your friends and, and playing, that's for the love of music. That's not really, you're losing money on that. Yeah. And the, I think most of the gigs that I play with the groups that I play with are, it is, just because I love playing with them. Right. And so right. if I was doing it all as a job, if I needed to pay my mortgage with all of that stuff, you know, then I think I would lose that passion that I have for playing and it would become my job and I would start to maybe resent yes. the, the process a little yeah. bit. And don't take this the wrong way, but that, those types of gigs, it's almost, this is probably not a good word for that, but it's almost like a hobby. Mm-hmm. In that it keeps you sharp. You get a little bit of pay for it. Maybe you break even, maybe you don't, but it does keep you sharp and it keeps you connected to people yeah. who are like minded and really talented. But it's it, but if you exactly right, you know, if you did it, if you had to do 14 of those in a week, mm-hmm. it would, you would probably would become resentful and it would probably be a very difficult way to make a living. I don't want to look at my horn and be like, I don't want to see you anymore. Right. Get out of my sight. Right. I don't want to look at the my shop in my garage right. and go, oh, damn it. I got to go out there and do another 12 hours and make 42 more bowls. I got to make 42 more bowls. Otherwise, uh, I can't. Otherwise, you know. my wife doesn't eat. Right. I don't eat. <laughs> I need to eat. Yeah. I exactly. Don't, yeah. The other way, it, it's not pleasurable anymore. As a ta- It becomes a task. It's not fun. Yeah. Yeah. But that's kind of where I'm at with going that professional route because that was that's what I wanted I thought when I went into college I was like oh I'm gonna get a degree in jazz and I'm gonna go all the way up I'm gonna get you know a master's or whatever and go to the east coast go to New York and play and I'll be playing in all these different groups and yeah just it wasn't for me I I didn't need a piece of paper that said you were good at playing that you could play jazz you could be a jazz musician I knew that I could still do that and you know, and to be honest, I, I don't play that much jazz anymore. I mean, some of the groups I play in are just, I'm playing like Taylor Swift songs, but hey, I'll take a 
killer solo on uh shake it off every once in a while and you know i'll get the nod from my saxophone player yeah I'm like, yeah well there's only one chord so i couldn't mess it up <laughs> yeah you you, you could have messed it up right <laughs> we can come back and talk about imposter phenomena sure, yeah. another day well and things change over time you might have a plan and you know it sounds like home is really important to you and setting down roots are really important to you and so I'm going to segue to something else I wanted to talk about, and I want to talk about really why I wanted to talk to you today. Huh? So there are, I looked it up, actually. I actually did research, which I almost never do for a podcast. There's just over 1 million high school teachers in the United States. 1 million? Yeah, it's like 1.07 million people. If you Google it, that's what you're going to find. And so, and like, like I've told you at the beginning, we've interviewed all kinds of high school psychology teachers, but no, you're our first high school, I'm, I'm, I keep saying band and orchestra, but what would be the proper Just term? Just band, yeah, band director. High school band director. Yeah. But ladies and gentlemen, there's a very specific reason, Spence, that I invited you on the podcast. And this is the big reveal. And now, after waiting very patiently, I'm going to say about... 37 minutes into the podcast, <laughs> we've turned up a third microphone so she can say hello, mystery guest. Hello. <laughs> big reveal on the pod. <laughs> on the pod. It's a big reveal. Welcome to the podcast for the first time ever, my daughter, Allison Landrum. <sighs> Hi, Allison. You actually have to use your real voice and not a whisper voice. That, that, <laughs> that's much better. A little shy on the mic. Are you? Eat the mic. I'm eating the mic. So so this is so much fun for me, and it, it is just a real pleasure. I'll let the two of you talk about why you're here today. Why are we here? We are here for a Christmas visit. For Christmas. And Allison, what would, it, what would be the specific reason why I invited Spence to be on the podcast? Well, I am engaged to a fellow educator. Oh, my God. Yeah. Reveal. Reveal. That's the big reveal. So, in was it November? What day in November 19th? Quick, 19th. 19th is the day that shall be remembered. Not in infamy. Not in but, infamy. Um, yeah, Roosevelt did not say that. He didn't. And so, after I f discovered that really delightful news, one of the things I hatched is that when you were going to be here in Boise, I wanted to have... The two of you together and interview Spence as a high school educator, which I d was very delightful to hear I about. I feel like all I did was talk about myself. Wow. Whoops. Sorry. That, that's, <laughs> that is actually the point of interviewing someone on the podcast. <laughs> I didn't talk about the state of education or some philosophies of teaching and just kind of babbled on about what a trombone. Well, but <laughs> I, I think. Spence, though, for our listeners, uh, hearing that perspective of a high school teacher, but in a different subject, will be really interesting. Mm -hmm. People who are interested in education will be interested in that. But the reason that you that that I wanted to talk to you was obviously the connection to my daughter. So it's so fun to have you with us as well, Allison. It's been fun. It's been fun. So what is it like? You're living together in Denver. You're now planning a wedding. What is it like just in that whole process, either A, planning for a wedding, and B, living with an educator and seeing what those responsibilities are like? And I guess C, how is it similar or different to watching what the father, the educator, was like? Ooh. Big question. Well, she knows the names of students I come home yelling about. <laughs> I, I also know the students' names who you're most proud That's of. That's true. And whose lives you're most involved Don't in. say them on the pod. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you know who I'm talking yeah. about. Oh, yeah. We can edit those. <laughs> yeah. You can say whatever you want. Jim Smith, I don't have any chance. I think it was, you know, as you transitioned from middle school to high school, it was interesting to watch the marching band lifestyle. Mm. The commitment that it takes. The great that time heirs. of year, the time that it takes, the work that you have to take home. Mm -hmm. During the summer, I'm infinitely jealous of the time that you spend not at school. Yeah. Especially Sorry. as I work. Even on home. winter break, too. You're like, Why are you off? <laughs> I'm just jealous. Yeah. Really. But yeah, there are some similarities. Sure. You know, uh, my wife, Lisa, feels the same way. I say my wife. Obviously, the two of you know my wife, Lisa. I say it for the listeners. Yeah. My wife, Lisa. 
feels the exact same way. She would watch me have three months off in the summer. And by the way, for every educator listening, we all know we don't have three months off no. in the summer. We just don't go into the office three mm-hmm. months. In the Sometimes summer. I do. Yeah. Okay. But um, Lisa would be, you know, working a full-time job and going into her office every day. And I would be at home. It's just a different lifestyle. It's a different schedule. You know, educators might work 80 hours a week, just not 80 hours in their office. I think that would be the hardest thing transitioning out of being an educator would be not having those built-in breaks. I don't know if it would be good or bad, but I've always been in school. I've never not been in school. This is, I've been a teacher for eight years. And before that, I was in college. And before that, I was in high school. Before that, middle school. I've never had a uh, nine to five that wasn't, you know, education. So yeah, that would be hard to not have that time built in. Have you ever had that time? It's really hard. I figured out this semester, I think, is my 59th semester oh. of, wow. of school. I, you know, as a kid, I mean, as a teenager, I had, you know, some nine to fives, but I've never had a real job is what I would say. Oh. And it, it was amazing. I mean, in the summers, I would take my kids to the pool, you know, and I, I liked being off when they were out of school. Yeah. I also think as a divorced dad, it was super important that I could be around for them as much as they could be around me. So, and have that flexibility. Boise State was great to me. They let me, if I wanted to be available in the morning to take them to school, I could take them to school. I was available every afternoon to pick them up. So I never taught early mornings or late afternoons. Mm. They always let me teach in the middle of the day. So they gave me that flexibility. And now that I don't have kids in school, I teach early in the morning or I will teach late in the afternoon so that my colleagues who have kiddos right now have the flexibility that they gave me. That is nice too, thinking about just when you go to work, if you have kids, you know, you can drop them at school or they might even go to the school that you teach at. And then when school's over, you can take them home or you can pick them up from their school and you have that Absolutely. flexibility. Because a lot of time, at least from what I see from Allison, is that, you know, she had beyond the nine to five work day a lot, quite mm-hmm. a bit. And I don't have to really take work home necessarily. Yeah. Parents and advertising have a pretty tough go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm reminded of a time that I took Allison to school one morning and uh, about 30 feet outside of Trailwind Elementary got pulled over by a police officer going 27 and a 20. Mm. I remember that. Criminal. He had to make a, he had to make a uh, quota. I think, I I don't want to call it a federal case, but he made a case out of it. Mm. I just wanted to drop her off. I'll come back. Give me the ticket. No, I'm going to give you the ticket right here. Yeah. Flashing lights and all. Years later, I was pulled over doing the same thing. They made me write an essay though. (laughs) <laughs> oh, in the Timberlane parking lot? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm going to tell you that Timberlane parking lot was the scariest place I ever was. I was so happy when you drove yourself after that because me sitting in there watching those young drivers leave that parking lot. Treacherous. I, I should have just set up a camera and filmed it every day. I could have <laughs> had my own MTV show, I'm telling you. I make it a point to park in the middle school parking lot because it's just the teachers on the middle school side of my school. Because it's the Wild West in the high school parking lot, seeing them drag race their trucks in the parking lot. And I almost get killed walking to my car if I try and park in that lot. So, And even if my students are like, oh, Mr. Malott, really excited to get my license. I'm like, just tell me when and where you'll be driving so I can stay off the roads. (laughs) (laughs) No kidding. Yeah, Uh, absolutely. Well, I've kept you almost an hour. We've got a little bit of time left. Was there something that you were expecting to talk about that I didn't cover yet? Was Not there something? Coming. No surprises. Allison, you've got a live mic. Is there anything you wanted to ask either one of us? <laughs> yeah, I'm on the mic. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I enjoyed listening to your conversation. Did you know? I did. Yeah. Do you, Spence, do you have any questions you want to ask either me or your fiance? No, no. Well, I already asked you if you'd marry me. So, I mean, that was the biggest question I had. Yeah. How did that go? Do you want to, do you want to share just a br- oh. broad overview of how that went? Do you want sure. to memorialize that here in a podcast? <laughs> Once and for all. Once and for all. Yeah. I feel like we didn't get asked enough about it. So it's like, you know, now it's Now you can say, stone. go yeah. to this episode yeah. 135, just, go to the 47 minute mark, uh-huh. and then you can just listen to the damn thing. Oh, I like right, that. Right, exactly. Instead of people asking us anymore. You just over and over. Go, have you heard of Psych Sessions? You got to go there. Yeah. Then you can listen to uh, mm, the story mm-hmm. recounted. Yeah. 
Good for numbers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not worried about the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my point. Oh, we'll, we'll take the numbers. We'll take them. Yeah. <laughs> Sponsored by numbers. Sponsored by every kiss begins with K. <laughs> uh, well, it was not K. I did not go to K. Nor Jared. Nor Jared. L- who was your jeweler? Oh, Williams Jeweler of Inglewood, actually. Sponsored Thanks by to- Williams uh, Jewelers oh, yeah. of this- Inglewood. <laughs> shout like, out to like, AJ. Yeah, shout out to AJ. Oh. AJ uh, and his design <laughs> team at Williams Jewelers of Inglewood. You get a cease and desist as soon as you post this. It's like, uh, we do not sponsor uh, this podcast. We do not endorse. <laughs> cease and desist. We haven't said anything know, that could be embarrassing <laughs> yet. But. It is a good story, though. Yeah. The, the, the proposal. Do tell. As a... Uh, musician he used his career to dun, get dun, me dun, to be at a place by a time i knew it was coming but i didn't know the day the moment he told me to meet him after a gig fake gig downtown yeah at a hotel it was a fake gig it was, I realized fake soon gig. It was a fake gig but you didn't know that at the time no i just i, no, I, I met him at a place and he was dressed well and, and you've met him after a gig sure oh plenty many of times, times. Yeah, yeah so this was normal yeah, yeah. Well, oh you look nice but i didn't think anything of it you know he just played a gig I did wonder where his trombone was, though. Yeah, I didn't have it in hand. And the I didn't really know how to lie my way out of that one. So I just said that all of my equipment was in a green room that the hotel had provided for us. And that I had left it in there. And when we met in the lobby, she said, where's your trombone at? Oh, yeah, it's in the green room. We were a super fancy gig. Do you want to go upstairs with me to the green room and grab my stuff? And while I was even trying to make it like inconvenient for her, I was like, do you mind if we go out to your car again, you know, or if we can pull your car around so I can put my stuff in? She's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And we go up to the eighth floor, which I had to use a key card for too. She didn't notice, but I had to use a key card to get in the elevator. You know, maybe that was the hotel giving us access, but as a musician, it's kind of funny because they never give you anything or like <laughs> help you in any way when you're per- doing performance. Load in through the kitchen. Yeah, load in. Yeah. Make sure you're not seen by anyone as you walk into this building. So we went up to the alleged green room and I'm fumbling about pretending like, oh, I think it's maybe down this way. I don't know. Were you nervous? I was really nervous. Yeah. And then you don't normally get nervous. I don't, but it was, I don't know. A once in a lifetime. It was moment. a once. Yeah, I didn't want to screw it up. I wanted it to be a good story potentially. Yeah. And so, anyways, I just pulled the trigger and I, I opened the door and I was like, "This is the green room." And I opened it and then I had decorated it with a bunch of candles and flowers on the bed that made a heart shape that looked like a butt. I was told afterwards it looked like butt shapes. It, that's how he draws hearts. Yeah, look a little butt. But, it is what it is. Yeah. And and then I asked her. Well, first I said two words. Oh yeah, she she yelled fake gig. Yeah, yeah. It was fake. <laughs> Because I had seen, you know, I'd seen this coming for weeks. Yeah. Oh, I'm a terrible liar, too. And I was being really sketchy for like a couple of weeks. Yeah. Just kind of hiding my phone. Terrible liar is a really good characteristic to have, by the way. I think so, too. And a future husband, terrible liar is awesome. Yeah. I'm only good at lying when it comes to like telling my parents or (laughs) telling my parents that I have plans when I don't. So we don't have to go over to dinner. <laughs> okay. If you're listening to this, <laughs> then you already Most know. Most likely future listener, probably your <laughs> yeah, parents. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shout out to your parents. Shout out to parents. <laughs> or parents-in-law. Yeah. Parents no, I would, I've oh, never it, lied to you about okay. plans. <laughs> it's okay. I'll leave the lying to Allison for, for a, oh, a my capsule. Oh, point. I hope we. Oh, I hope yeah. it becomes comfortable enough that you can lie to me. Yeah, no, okay. Oh, I hope we, have, we will get there I, hope, I can lie to I hope you. We can get, I hope we can get to a lying relationship <laughs> on our own. Yeah. Maybe. Oh my gosh. But yeah, she said yes and uh I did. Now I'm on the pod. Yeah. We came straight here. <laughs> <laughs> straight here from the fake gig. From the fake yeah. gig, yeah. Straight from the fake gig. He had a nice night planned and that was those first of many stops. That was yeah. a great date. Memorable night. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you both for Coming home for Christmas and spending an hour talking to our listeners and your father and your future father-in-law, you being the future son-in-law. I signed all of his presents that way, too, for Christmas. I future son-in-law. Like, you'll know who it is. <laughs> There's no one else in the room. <laughs> well, and I think I, I put it that into an email or something you did. to you. you. I think that might probably freaked you out. No, I, I was I was okay <laughs> freaking you out a tiny bit. <laughs> of all the things you're going to freak out over, that may be number 47, 47 or something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, thank you both for being here with me. And thank you, Allison, for sitting so long, so patiently 
for the oh, grand the reveal. Too. <laughs> Thank you. That was fun. Thank you. <laughs>